Good morning again, let us pray. Giving honor to God who is the head of my life, to all of you who came out to hear a word from the Lord today. Lord, we ask you to bless this sermon, pour down your wisdom from heaven, remove everything that is in Daniel, and let your spirit shine through. Bless the ears that hear it, in Jesus' name, amen. As most of you know, my father passed a week and a half ago after a horrible car accident. Since then, I've had to work on organizing and speaking at a celebration of his life in New Haven and travel and eulogize him at his gravesite in Kentucky. All of that and doing what I have to do to deal with his estate and this strange grieving process as he was my best friend and mentor, as well as my father. For these reasons, God has given me a slightly different sermon than usual, and I thank you for your patience and understanding. Today's message will be in three parts. As Jesus shared his walk and what transpired in recent weeks with the two disciples in today's scripture, I want to start by sharing with you, my church family, about what's transpired in my life since I last spoke with you. This serves the dual purpose of my not having to explain it to each of you individually. Second, since we are talking about recognizing the risen Christ, I wanna share some words I spoke at my father's gravesite that reflect how I saw the risen Christ in him. And finally, I want to end with what would be a more typical sermon about how we can see the risen Christ in our lives. Have no fear, all this should take no more than 45, 50 minutes tops. I'm kidding. While I realize that it is not all about me, I am a pastor who connects deeply with those he pastors. We as a church do this when we share our joys and concerns on Sunday mornings, where I often share messages I think will resonate with what we're going through as a church family. I mention this as I and my wife are not just the pastor and pastor's wife, but members of the congregation as well. I also share intimately with those who come to prayer service, where we share testimonies of what God has done for us and pray for our prayer requests. And those of you who have been to our Bible studies know that they not only center around scripture, but offer those who attend the chance to relate to one another on a deeply personal level as well. So today I wanna to share a little bit of what has transpired in my life before getting to the sermon proper. It is not traditional, but it is how God gave it to me. And while it is important for me to listen to the church about what and how to preach, ultimately it is what God gives me to give to you that matters most. Two weekends ago was my quarterly respite weekend and I decided to take my son and my best and his best friend, a friend whose father had passed recently, to the house in, uh, my dad owned in Cape Cod. I had lunch with my dad on Monday, and Tuesday was driving back to Hamden when I kept receiving what I thought were spam calls from some healthcare organization. When I finally picked up and told them to stop calling me, they asked if I knew someone who lived in Massachusetts. Now, my dad lives in New Haven when he's not in his second lab in South Korea, so I said no and hung up the phone. Then it occurred to me it might be my dad they were talking about, and it was. As it turned out, he was in New Bedford Hospital on the Cape after a car accident. So I called my wife, and after I dropped the boys off, we headed back only to find they were transporting him to Rhode Island Hospital for surgery that night. Dad and I spoke briefly on the phone while he was still in New Bedford, and he sounded his usual chipper self, only he said he couldn't feel anything from his chest down. But when we got to see him in the hospital in Rhode Island, he didn't look so good and was asking for a large apple. This is great luck, I said for we just happened to have some very large apples in the trunk of the car. It's a large apple phone he wants, my wife said. This got a chuckle from my father, but it was clear to see he was no longer chipper and that the collar around the neck and the situation he was going through was getting to him. 
Later, we got a call saying they were postponing the surgery to get equipment to deal with his heart defibrillator. Then at 2 a.m., they called and said his condition had worsened so that he had to be put on a ventilator. The next morning, they said we'd need to have a family meeting. So we got there, and I put my brother and sister on speakerphone, and the doctors told us that even if the surgery was as successful as possible, my dad would have a horribly limited life that he would not only be wheelchair bound, but would suffer cognitive impairment and likely be unable to use his hands, that he would likely be on a ventilator the rest of his life. And they asked us if my dad would want to live that way. Now, my dad was someone who had survived a heart attack six years ago, despite being misdiagnosed in the emergency room for two hours before being operated on. A man who had built up his strength to where he was curling 35 pound barbells. A man who would pass out while playing squash because of his heart condition and get up and play some more. Something that scared one of his squash partners so much they refused to keep playing with him. A man with a mind so sharp that at 83, he was still running two scientific laboratories, one at Yale and one in South Korea. As the doctors explained what his life would look like and how his brain would deteriorate due to the sedation he would need to recover from surgery, a surgery that did not even have the potential to fix his broken spine, we all came to the same sad conclusion. That day I FaceTimed my aunts and cousins and held my cell phone to my dad's unconscious face to let family say goodbye. I talked to my sister who flew in from Alaska and we agreed to have two services for my dad, a celebration of life in New Haven and a funeral in Louisville, Kentucky, where my dad asked to be buried beside his parents. Since today's sermon is about recognizing the risen Christ, I'd like to now share a few words that I shared at his gravesite, words that revealed the risen Christ I saw in my dad. Larry was a world-renowned scientist with laboratories in Yale and South Korea, a man who some believe should have won a Nobel Prize for his work, yet he was profoundly humble. Larry used to walk around Yale wearing a janitor's jacket he bought from one of the maintenance men at the university, which he sometimes wore over his trademark red shirts. When I asked him how he got it and why he wore it, he said he paid a maintenance man a hundred bucks for it. As to why, he said he liked to remind folks that we are all the same. One day I told him that he was special and that he didn't pay attention to other people's titles. He looked perplexed for a moment, and then he said, oh, you mean I treat people like people? This was an attitude he would exhibit even to the very day of his accident. But that afternoon, I would have lunch with my father at the Captain Kidd in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. This lunch, as usual, lasted several hours. We discussed what was going on in our lives and what was happening with me and my ministry. As usual, he was loving, thoughtful, and helpful. During the course of our meal, he started chatting with the waitress. We discovered that she was in her 20s and had been a teacher before, but hadn't liked it much and wasn't sure what she intended to do with the rest of her life. Essentially, Larry did everything but ask for her resume. This exemplified Larry's attitude toward people he interacted with. To me, she might have been a waitress. To Larry, she was another human being. Larry explained that he looked for ways to talk to people by finding out what interested them. For all of his professed agnosticism, Dad was profoundly connected to the world's major religions. Toward the end of his life, he studied all of the major religions, and when I walked into his apartment after he passed, I found looking up at me from his kitchen table a copy of the Koran with a book on Confucius, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad sitting below it. He was interested in whether Jesus was a historical figure and even read parts of the Bible. He liked to quote the scripture where Jesus said we were supposed to follow the laws to suggest that Christians weren't following Jesus' words because they didn't keep kosher. This didn't bother me, especially since he didn't keep kosher either. 
Yet before I found out that dad wanted to be buried in a Jewish cemetery near his parents, I did not know the depth of his Jewish ties, as he had never mentioned this to me before. And when I opened his wallet yesterday, or I found the following wedged in between his credit cards and health insurance cards. The note written on a piece of plastic coated paper, which apparently he carried with him daily, reads as follows. Alenu. It is our duty to praise the master of all, to acclaim the greatness of the one who forms all creation. For God did not make us like the nations of other lands and did not make us the same as other families of the earth. God did not place us in the same situations as others and our destiny is not the same as anyone else's. For they bowed to vanity and emptiness and prayed to a God which helps not, end quote. Ultimately, I can only conclude that my father's commitment to Judaism was stronger than I knew. A few weeks before he passed, we had some talk of life after death. Dad told me he wasn't worried about whether or not he'd get into heaven since he had me for a son. I told him I didn't think that's how it works. But I want to tell you, friends of Larry, friends of mine, that I know that his spirit is free that it is in a beautiful place. For he was a beautiful man, and I can feel his spirit right here, right now, in my body. God loved Larry, and whether Larry knew it or not, Larry loved God. For he loved God's people, and he was thankful for the life God had given him. When I was reading one of my daily devotions yesterday, God spoke to my direct circumstances, as he often does. This is something the great spiritual psychologist Carl Jung called synchronicity, or what I call God winks. Times when God lets us know by some remarkable coincidence that he knows all about us and is watching over our every move. The following is taken from the April 22nd devotional from Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. See if you don't agree with me that the following was indeed a God wink. In the first phases of life, disheartenments come. People who used to be lights flicker out, and those who used to stand with us pass away. When big men go, we are sad, until we see that they are meant to go. The one thing that remains is looking in the face of God for ourselves. People ask me how I'm doing. I tell them that I'm doing fine that I feel dad's spirit right here in my upper chest and throat area, in my spiritual heart. I break down crying from time to time, but it's a good cry. In the end, dad lived a great life. He lived to 83, was both a great lover and a great man. And while his accident was tragic, he didn't suffer much and no one else was hurt. Dad, I love you more than words can say. You were the best father a man could ever have. I look forward to seeing you in heaven. God rest your soul. That's what I said at his gravesite. And while those of you who came to the celebration of his life heard a slightly different version, one that emphasized his curiosity about Jesus, that caused some to believe he had seen the risen Christ himself, this version spoke to my dad's humility his love for humanity, and his Jewish roots, all characteristics of the risen Christ. But I want you to know, my congregational church family, that this sermon is not all about me and my dad, that I see the risen Christ in each and every one of you. I see the risen Christ in all the love you have showered upon me since I first started preaching here a year and a half ago, in all the love you show each other in all the Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings we've shared together, in all of the tireless efforts so many of you have put into making Congregational Church of Burlington the warm, loving, and welcoming church it is today. A church that is growing due in part to our outreach efforts, but mostly because of the love we share, the love of a risen Christ. I had decided to follow the lectionary when I first outlined this sermon, which I intended to preach last Sunday, and didn't want to change what God had given me. God is good, church, and I was blessed to find that my sermon title 
and much of my ideas for the sermon fit perfectly with the tribute to my dad in whom I saw so many aspects of the risen Christ. You see, church, Jesus is with us, with us all the time. But like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, we often fail to recognize him. Church, I want you to know that not only do I see the risen Christ in you every week we walk this Christian journey together, but I, I am especially grateful for the risen Christ I've seen in you since my father passed. Through it all, you've been right beside me, just as Jesus was right beside the two disciples in our scripture. For you've been there with me in prayer. You've been there with me in text messages and phone calls. You've been with me in the flowers and cars you sent. Some of you were even there with me at the celebration of my father's life in New Haven. That's how I've seen the risen Christ in the last week and a half. But I want you to know that it doesn't take a loved one's death to see the risen Christ. That you can see the risen Christ in a baby, in a sunset, in a flower, in a smile. Church, we who call ourselves Christians are blessed. Blessed to have been awakened to the risen Christ. A risen Christ we will see one day after we pass, or better yet, when he comes back in his second coming. Jesus has revealed himself to us, just as he ultimately revealed himself to the two disciples he walked with. And while this begs the question of why Jesus doesn't reveal himself to everyone the way he has revealed himself to us, for that, I have no answer. I just know that you and I have been given a great gift. Let us not sit on our knowledge, but go into a sin-sick world and proclaim to those who haven't seen him yet that he is real and that he is risen. Can I get an amen? Right now, there might be one who does not know Christ or one who feels they have backslidden and want to reestablish their relationship with God. If that's you, I want you to know that Jesus is waiting, that God loves you. If you feel called to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, just repeat after me. Lord, I am a sinner in need of salvation. I turn my life over to you. I believe you are the Son of God and that you died on a cross for my sins and that you were raised again on the third day, conquering death and hell. If that was you and you're here in the sanctuary, I ask you to speak with me after service. Finally, if there's anyone who does not have a church home and wants to join this body of believers, if that's you, I ask you to speak with one of the deacons after church is over. God bless you all. And at this time, please stand for the closing hymn. Come, Christians, join to sing in the White Book, Supplemental Hymnal Number 20. Thank you.